very nice to be here. This is actually my first time in the AZ, and I hope it's, it's not the last time. Um, so, yes, I have turned on the microphone. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Um, we should be good. So today I'm going to talk about, as you can see, insights from non-Markovian random walks, and in particular, some applications to decision modeling. And the first part of the talk, um, we'll see something about large deviations. The second part, we'll see something about extremes. I don't think there's anything on anomalous transport, but two out of three ain't bad. Some of you will have heard parts of this talk before, and I, I'm sorry for that. Um, but I think it is the first time I've given a talk under our new king. So that's something new for today. Um, and it's also, I think, the last talk I will give under the flag of, of Queen Mary. So I'm actually moving later in the autumn to one of the other London universities to UCL. So if you try and email me and it goes into some black hole, then Google for my new contacts and you should find me. OK. So let's start very simple. It's still quite early in the morning. Let's start with Markovian random walks. Let's make it as simple as we can. And let's think about one dimension and discrete space or continuous space, but certainly discrete time. So what does that mean? That means that we have some position random variable, time t plus 1, which is the position at time t, plus some step length or noise, if you like, where the step lengths are independent, identically distributed random variables. Very boring. And the most boring example is the case where the step lengths are plus 1 with some probability p plus, and minus 1 with some probability v minus. So just a biased, discrete space, random walk. And you can already think of this as a very simple, very stupid model of repeated decision making. If you're choosing between two options with no regard for what's happened in the past, you're just tossing a coin at every time step, perhaps a biased coin, and you take one choice with probability p plus, go to the right, and one choice with probability p minus. So there's already a, a connection, a very stupid connection, between a random walker and decision making, and we'll explore that more a little bit later. But let's now make life a bit harder and think about non-Markovian random walks. And I want to try and convince you in the talk today that adding memory, even to very simple models like the one we've just seen, can help to both illuminate the general principles and general mechanisms in non-Markovian statistical mechanics and help give us some insight into slightly more realistic models of decision making that aren't just tossing a coin. But of course, as soon as I say I'm adding memory, then the question I hope you're asking is, well, how? There are about as many ways to add memory as there are people working on non-Markovian statistical mechanics. So, for example, you could think about having a, a latent variable, a hidden Markov model, some kind of internal states. You could think about simply putting in by hand non-exponential waiting times in continuous time. You can think about certain types of reset or renewal or run and tumble dynamics, and we already heard those uh, discussed a bit yesterday. And I've worked on some of those things, but what I'm going to talk about today is another class of models with memory. And it's the class of processes where the, the step distribution, or if you like, the probabilities for making particular steps in the future, depend on the time average velocity of the random walk in the past. So on the whole history of the random walk, albeit in a very simple way. And in this class of processes, I'm going to tell you about two bits of work. The first is what we can learn from them about fluctuation mechanisms in systems with long-range memory. And this is mainly uh, work with Rob Jack, who I think is here next week, so we'll just miss each other. Um, and then secondly, the, the promised application to decision making, which is partly some now quite old work that was part of a big interdisciplinary grant I was involved in, and then more recent work uh, with a PhD student who's just finished. 
Okay, so let's start on part one, which is probably the more technical part, and then life will get a bit more entertaining in the second half. First part is basically, I like to think of a tale of two elephants. And the first elephant is what now is quite a, a famous paradigmatic model, if you like, the so-called elephant random walk, introduced in statistical physics in about 2004. And it goes like this. I have a position, as before, in discrete space, but now I have some memory parameter, which in general can be between minus one and plus one. And the rule for the movement of my random walker is very simple. If the time average velocity at time t, so the position divided by t, is v subscript t, then the next step is right or left with probabilities 1 plus or minus a times vt over 2. So if a is positive, there's a positive feedback where you're more likely to go in the direction you went in the past. And if a is negative, then there's a negative feedback. And we'll concentrate on the positive case, so A between 0 and 1. And this is at least one version of the original elephant random walk. So a random walker that remembers its whole history. Elephants never forget, allegedly. But in this very simple way, it just remembers the time average velocity. The second model is what Rob likes to call the, the Gaussian elephant random walk, which in some ways is very similar except now my position is in continuous space. And I still have a memory parameter that I'll set between 0 and 1. And now the rule for the dynamics is that if the time average velocity is v, the next step is from a Gaussian distribution, clues in the name, with mean a times v and variance 1. So if you think about it, these models look at first sight quite similar, conditioned on the past, the mean of the next step is the same in both cases. So it's a times vt, and the variance is 1 in both cases. So the mean and the variance of the next step are the same in both of these models, but yet they're different models. And what we're interested in is what's their typical behavior, and more interesting, what's their fluctuations, and what can we learn from them about more complicated models. But to get the typical behavior, there's a, there's a very simple kind of hand-waving argument that goes like this. Let's define delta to be the mean displacement of the next step. So the displacement of the t plus 1th time step conditioned on having velocity vt in the past. So it's a kind of conditional expectation of the step length. And with that, you can convince yourself very easily that typical trajectories are given by a discrete mapping. Where does this come from? Well, you expect that the velocity at time t plus 1 typically looks like the position at time t plus the expected step length divided by t plus 1. So this gives you a kind of discrete mapping for typical expected trajectories. And then it's very easy to say to see that you get fixed points, of course, where vt plus 1 is equal to vt, which trivially is where v is equal to delta of v. In other words, where the expected length for the next step is the same as what you've had in the past. And as usual, you can then determine the stability of such fixed points by a kind of cobweb diagram type argument, where the crucial thing is the slope of this function. So here I plot vt plus 1 against vt for some arbitrary functions, diagonal in red, so the fixed points where these things cross. And the case you see on the left, well, what happens when you have a fluctuation that's a little bit above the fixed point? Then what you expect to see next is the black line. That's something that's a bit smaller than you had in the past, so it will push you back towards the fixed point. And similarly, if you're below the fixed point, what you expect to see next pushes you towards the fixed point. So in this case, with the slope less than 1, is a stable fixed point. And of course, by an analogous argument, this case with the slope greater than 1 is an unstable fixed point. Yeah.
for the, for, the, for the velocity. Delta is the expected step length, so it's like instantaneous velocity, if you like. So it's the, the expected length of the next step, given you've had a velocity v in the past. I think I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I quite get your question, but if, you're, if your velocity in the past is, let's say, 0.7, and the expected length of your next step is 0.7, then you expect that the velocity is unchanged. Yeah, there's a time scale one. There's a time scale one. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's discrete time, so the, the time scale is just, just, it's just, it's just one. Yeah, sorry, I think I quite, didn't quite, quite catch the question. Okay, so that gives us um, stability of fixed points. And actually, for both of these models that we've just seen, it's very easy. The expected step length is just A times the velocity in the past. So the fixed point is velocity zero. And if A is between zero and one, it's a stable fixed point. So in the long time limit, both of these models uh, converge to velocity zero. But we're interested also in fluctuations. And the first thing you can say, say about the fluctuations is that they generally involve excursions at the start of the trajectory. Why is that? Well, because it's much easier to change the average velocity at the beginning. It costs you a lot less than it does to change the average velocity at the end. So we expect that fluctuations for these models are going to involve excursions at the start. And actually, the models are so simple that you can calculate things exactly. And we're going to focus now on the case where A is greater than a half, but still less than one, where the memory effect is, is strong in some sense. The elephant random walk is, in fact, just a polyurn type model. And so you can use results of polyurns, as done, for example, by Franchini. And you can get a large deviation form for the probability that at time t you see velocity v. In the long time limit, it looks like the exponential of minus something times t. So this is a kind of ordinary large deviation principle, except that the something, the rate function, is a bit weird. It's non-analytic. It's a large deviation principle with a non-analytic rate function, which corresponds, roughly speaking, to a dynamical phase transition. The Gaussian elephant random walk is even easier because everything's Gaussian and you can calculate essentially everything pretty trivially. And again, you can find the asymptotic probability distribution for seeing velocity v at time t. Looks like the exponential now of minus something, which is just quadratic from the Gaussian structure of the model, but t to a different power. So this is again a large deviation principle, but with some modified speed, with some different power of t, which is something you don't see in the Markov case. And this kind of modified speed was seen earlier in work I did with Hugo Touchet. If A is greater than a half, then this actually is, is of course, super diffusive. Um, so you can see that quite easily. So we so roughly speaking, a generalized elephant random walk, at least what I call it, is just anything where the probability for the next step depends on some function of the velocity in the past. And so in the original elephant random walk, it just depends on the fraction of steps right or left, which is basically directly proportional to the velocity. Um, but you can have any function of the, of the velocity. And then you've got a, a kind of nonlinear polyurn in mass language. Yeah. Sorry. How does it... How so the typical velocity is, is, is zero, but the distribution about zero um, is given in the elephant random walk by, by this form. So you have a, a, a kink at zero. Um, and in this case, you have a quadratic function about zero, but still you concentrate about zero, um, but more slowly than in the ordinary diffusive case. I think so, yeah, um, with, with probably some corrections, but I, you, you, I would still expect quadratic. Um, I'm, I'll say something about generic um, models in a moment. Yeah. Yeah, 
it goes, it goes faster than t, but, but um, slower than t squared, so you still concentrate about zero, but just more slowly than in the ordinary diffusive case. Okay. Uh, so you get the exponent from here, so I guess the exponent of position is, um, let me get this right, <laughs> I always get these things wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, the Markovian case will be, be A equals zero, um, and then the, the velocity scales as T, and um, here the velocity scales as, as, as T to the one minus, one minus A, or A minus one. Uh, Yeah, I think you, for these simple models, you can show that. Certainly for the elephant random walk, it's shown in the Gaussian elephant random walk. It's so simple, yeah, that for these models, you can show that. Okay, so very simple models, um, but already different. The memory has introduced um, different behavior. Um, in the first case, we've got a, a large deviation function, but with some non elastic rate function with a kink at zero. And in the second case, we've got um, a large deviation principle but with a different power of t, so concentrating more slowly on zero than in the Markov case. And the question is, what causes the difference between these two things in these, these very simple models? And this was basically um, a contribution of Rob to untangle these things, and is written up um, in this paper here. So what you can do is you can look at the mechanisms leading to rare fluctuations in these two cases. And one way to do that, as I think is now fairly well known, is to use a control theory argument. So the idea is that you construct a control process where you try and make in your control process, use a variational argument to make the control process have typical paths that are the same as the rare paths in your original process. And for simple models, you can do that numerically quite easily. So control process where the rare fluctuations in the original process become typical. And then from that, you get numerically both the mechanisms and by the KL divergence, you also get a bound on the rate functions. So what I show you here is from such a control process for these two models, the typical velocity in the control process, don't worry about the Q for now, against time for both the elephant random walk and the Gaussian elephant random walk. So, let, so let's look at those in turn. First for the, the elephant random walk, oh, we use a control process which still has displacement plus or minus one, but now with time dependent probabilities. So you optimize by changing these time dependent Bs. And what you find then is these blue paths for typical behavior in your control process, which then, of course, give you the rare fluctuations in the original process. So we're looking at paths that finish with a velocity of 0.2. And what you find is that at the beginning of the paths, they have velocity almost exactly one. And that's, of course, the most you can do in the elephant random walk because you've only got plus minus one steps. So the best you can do is just go in one direction at the beginning. And then a decay at the end, which is of a power law form, which depends on this, this A that encodes the effect of the memory. And in fact, you can also get that by doing an expansion about the fixed point. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. It's a, it's a way to numerically quite easily get the most likely trajectory of the constrained process. But the interesting thing is to see what happens when you play with the length of the trajectory. So this first blue line has velocity 0.2 after 10 to the 5 time steps, and then the second blue line has velocity 0.2 after 10 to the 6 time steps. And you see the same power law decay at the end. You just see that the length of the plateau increases. Uh, so you just do a numerical variational um, principle, yeah.
Uh, so you do the, strictly speaking, you do the, the callback live with divergence between the original process and the control process, and you minimize that. Um, We can talk about the details afterwards if you're interested, but the, the important point for now is it's just a way of getting um, the, the mechanisms that lead to the rare fluctuations. So we have here what we call a long initial excursion. That's a finite size. It's never bigger than one, but as we increase the length of the trajectory, the length of the excursion gets longer. Uh, what is tau? Tau is the, the, the current time, and t is the final time. So tau is the, the intermediate time, my time variable, and t is the time at the end. Yeah. So this axis is tau. Didn't label the axis, which is terrible. Um, so this is, is velocity against tau, and then the final time is t. So that's the, the, the elephant random walk. And then the Gaussian elephant random walk. Well, here we use a control process that's Gaussian. Surprise, surprise, but now with a time-dependent mean, and we optimize over the, the values of the time-dependent mean. And what you find here is these green lines where you get very large hops on the first few steps, because here you can have arbitrary large step lengths. So here, the cheapest way to reach a particular fluctuation at the end is to have big hops at the beginning, oops, and then to decay again with the same power law. Power law is the natural dynamics of the process. And if you look now at what happens when you increase the time, so again you say, what's the most likely way to find a current of 0.2 after 10 to the 5 time steps, or a current of 0.2 after 10 to the 6 time steps, then the length of the excursion at the beginning stays roughly the same, but its height gets bigger. And we call this an initial giant leap. It's got diverging size, but finite length as t goes to infinity. And there's somehow a kind of analogy uh, with condensation in interacting particle systems, where the excess current is condensed on a, a finite length of the trajectory at the beginning. So for these simple models, you can do the control theory. You can find the optimal mechanisms. But our argument is that these kind of mechanisms, these two mechanisms, this long initial excursion and this initial giant leap, we expect to be generic and to appear also in more complicated models. And as a sort of cartoon way, what we're going to do for that is we're going to think about how to get a bound on the probabilities on the rate function, even if we can't do it exactly, by looking at trajectories that have a plateau at the beginning, and then decay with this power law. And the argument is that if you do that, these two mechanisms give bounds on the probabilities of rare events in more complicated models, even when you can't do the calculations directly. And I'll spend a slide or two saying some details about that, but don't worry too much if you don't get all of the details. So now, we're looking at more general models where we're interested not just in velocities, but in currents. Um, so we're looking at a class of models where the transition probabilities depend on the, the time average current. So for a single random walk, that's the same as the time average velocity. And we require that that current converges to, to some Q infinity um, in the long time limit. And then we think about deviations with currents above this long time mean. Of course, you can also do the other way, but let's stick to currents above the mean for now. And we think about how we can achieve those deviations by having some initial excursion that starts at the beginning and finishes at some time tau star. And the argument is that under certain assumptions, which I'll show you very briefly in the next slide, you can bound the probability that at time t, you see a velocity q, you can bound it from below, by restricting to paths where the excursion is of size q star, or strictly speaking, at least q star. So we're looking at excursions that are a length tau star at the beginning and a height q star. And the basic idea is that you want to find q star and tau star such that 
conditioned in your original process on having a value of current q star at time tau star, the expected current at time t is just the current you're interested in. That means that all the cost is in this initial excursion, and then you just um, relax with the natural dynamics um, to the final current. And then this gives you a bound on the probability. So let me say a few words about the certain assumptions and the way um, these two different mechanisms emerge from that. The key condition is that after the excursion, as I said, the time average current relaxes to its steady state value as a power law with some exponent one minus a, which is just what's written in this rather ugly equation. So I want that the expected current um, at time t, given I started at q star and t star, decays as a power law with power one minus a and some function which is in principle a function of q star and tau star. And we want this to hold at least for some values of q star and tau star. And you see actually that there are two possible cases, and maybe you already spotted the big difference between the elephant random walker and the Gaussian elephant random walker. If large excursions are possible, in other words, if this star equation is valid for q star going to infinity, and this curly F thing approaches some strictly positive value. And the probability of seeing a large excursion, so you can have an arbitrary large excursion, like in the Gaussian elephant random walk, um, goes like the exponential minus something to a power law. So you've got some power law decay for the probability of a large excursion. Then when you plug all this in and find your bound, you find that the probability um, for seeing a current Q at time t has a, a lower bound that looks like the exponential of minus t to some power multiplied by this stuff. And so it's, it's an assumption we, we need, but for, for you can show it very easily in, 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 in most models, actually. Um, yeah. So I don't specify what the A has to be, but I do require I have that power law decay. Um, I guess you could, you could construct weird models with memory where you had some you know, decay to the mean that wasn't power law, but I think all of these models where you have a dependence on the, the past velocity, the past current, you get a power law decay. Um, certainly, I've, I've not... I mean, in, in, our, in our random walk models, we know exactly what it is. It's the A I put in at the beginning, but in a, in a general model, it could be anything. Um, and it might be quite hard to find, but I just require I've got a, a power law. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you can do stuff by, by um, working in that. It, Send the state space, uh, but it's a bit ugly. Um, exactly. Yeah, so in. Um, I think that's been shown for the elephant random walk in general. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe, we can, maybe we can discuss that. Um, so in this case, where you're allowed to have arbitrarily large excursions, then following the technical details of this, and you don't need to worry too much about that, um, you find indeed a large deviation principle with t to some, some power that depends on this decay to the, the steady state velocity and on the probability of seeing a large excursion, that's the beta, um, and then a coefficient. Um, and this simple argument predicts the coefficient. If you compare that to the exact coefficient, which you know, for example, for the elephant random walk, it's not quite right because the paths, the real optimizing paths in the elephant random walk are not flat and then decay, they're a bit more curved. But it gives you um, the general mechanism and the general form. On the other hand, 
you always have the possibility, whether or not um, large excursions are possible, um, to think what happens for large values of time. And if this holds for large values of time, or at least values of time that are big compared to one, and again, you have some strictly positive limit of this curly F function, then you find a bound on the probability that looks like an ordinary large deviation principle. So if I take the exponential of both sides here, I get e to the minus t times something with, again, a coefficient that's predicted. This mechanism is always available, but it's very easy to show that if you have the other mechanism, if you have the possibility of arbitrary large excursions, this one always wins. So basically, the picture is, if you have the possibility of very large excursions, arbitrary large step lengths, you have an initial giant leap. Whereas if the size of the excursions is limited, then you get this long initial excursion. And the argument, as I said, is that these are generic mechanisms that you'll see also in other models. And we check that, for example, in a kind of non-Markovian exclusion process. So a partially asymmetric exclusion process where the probabilities of going right or left depend on the time average current in the past. And the prediction there is that it's the large initial excursion mechanism that gives you the long time behavior. And you can check, well, you can check the variance of the current against the prediction, and you can check the distribution of currents at time t. The dashed line is the prediction from this large initial excursion, and the red points are simulation. So it works pretty well. So random walks, even quite simple random walks, I argue, help us to untangle the, the general effects of feedback and the mechanisms that lead to large fluctuations. But what about applications? What's this got to do with the decision stuff I talked about at the beginning? And now life gets a little bit less technical for a moment. Modeling decision making goes back I suppose, loosely speaking, to the greatest happiness principle of Jeremy Bentham, around in the 1700s, 1800s, can still be seen today. This is the picture I always used to show of him in his box at UCL. He actually moved just before the pandemic to a shiny new box in their student inquiry center. This is not why I'm moving to UCL, by the way. Um, but anyway, he was obviously a little bit eccentric. He left his body to, to UCL. It's actually his skeleton. Actually, his clothes, they're kind of stuffed with straw. Um, and it's not really his head. And depending on who you listen to, that's either because they tried to kind of preserve his head with a kind of pickling process and it ended up looking very grotesque. And I've seen a picture of that. Um, I think they left his head there for a while and they had trouble with students from King's. I know there's somebody from King's here um, stealing, stealing his head. Um, so in the end, they went for a wax copy. So it's a wax copy of his head, but it's really his skeleton and his clothes. And he sits in this box at UCL, and the, there are various probably made-up stories that they take him to governing body meetings and stuff like that. I'm about to tell you that. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Um, his general happiness principle is a sort of forerunner of modern utility theory. Um, it was the idea that human be beings are supposed to make decisions to maximize their happiness. Um, and that is a sort of forerunner of utility. Um, you can think of utility in economic terms as a measure of the, the happiness or the satisfaction or the benefit you get from making a particular decision. And the idea is that if you're a completely rational human being, which of course we're not, you want to weigh up between two decisions, you weigh up the, the utility of the two decisions and you pick the one that's going to give you the highest utility. And that's sort of classical um, economic theory. It doesn't work that simply, and one of the reasons it doesn't work that simply is that the utility that you, you put into making your decisions, so-called decision utility, might be different from the utility you actually experience when you make that decision. And one reason for that is that you, you tend to misremember what happened in the past, and therefore your decision utility is kind of distorted based on your distorted memory of the past. Which leads us to the question of how human beings actually remember things. Well, of course, that's, that's quite complicated. 
but one sort of psychological heuristic is the so-called peak end rule. It was popularized by, by Daniel Kahneman and co-workers, Nobel Prize for Economics. And one of the things they did was some quite famous experiments on colonoscopies. So what they did was they took a bunch of patients who I'm told had to have colonoscopies anyway. So I'm not quite sure how you get ethics for this, but anyway. Um, and in most countries, at least when you have a colonoscopy, you don't have a general anesthetic, you're awake, you can feel the probe being moved around inside you. I'm not getting into too many details. I think they give you some mild sedatives so that you don't go completely freaked out. So they took these patients who were having colonoscopies, and at every minute, they asked them to rate how horrible it was. And then they plotted these graphs of pain against time for different patients. And then they went back to the patients at the end, and they asked them to, to give one number, one retrospective evaluation of the whole experience. And the claim was that they could predict this retrospective evaluation, this, this single number summarizing the memory of the experience, simply by taking a straight average, a straight mean, of the worst bit, the peak of the experience, and the last minute or so, the end of the experience. So they call this the peak end rule, and it implies in particular that the length of the whole procedure didn't seem to matter that much. So we'd look at these graphs and we'd say, well, okay, this is, this is pain against time, so the shaded area is integrated pain. So clearly patient B had a worse time than patient A. But actually that might not be how they remember it. And in fact, they even tested this um, by keeping the probe inside people at the end longer than was medically necessary, but by, by making it very gentle at the end, and people went away happier. I think one of these papers is called something like where more pain is preferred to less. Um, so very interesting. <laughs> but this, this big end rule has... I guess they... Yeah, I, I didn't look too much into the details. I guess they just took the probe out again and put it in again or stopped for a bit. <laughs> or they passed out, I don't know. <laughs> um, but they've also tested this peak end rule in, in happier scenarios, how you remember your holidays, the idea being remember you remember the best bit and the journey home, perhaps, how people evaluate um, sequences of numbers, uh, television commercials, how people remember those. Um, some weird experiment with Halloween sweets in America that I never fully understood. Um, and I think the picture is a bit mixed. Sometimes it seems to be a very good predictor of how people uh, remember things and, and others less well. But what is clear, I think, is that as humans, we don't, we don't remember our whole past. Our brains would probably explode if we did that. We remember snapshots. When in particular, we remember extremes. So the aim of what I'm going to tell you about now is to investigate how this kind of memory of extremes, and I'll concentrate on the peak part, not the end, affects future decisions. Not decisions about colonoscopies, but decisions in the case where you're making repeated choices. So whether to have cereal or toast for breakfast, whether to take the bus or the train. So let's build a very simple model of that. So we've got a single agent, a single person, repeatedly deciding between two choices, which I'll call plus or minus, with no um, moral evaluation of, the, of, of which is better, but just to label them plus or minus. And we keep track of the number of times the agent makes each choice up to time t, x plus for the plus choices, and x minus for the minus choices. And they have to make a choice at every time step, so of course these things have to add up to t. And this is obviously just a one-dimensional random walk, where this is the number of steps right, and this is the number of steps left, and we have some probabilities yet to be specified for going right or left. Turns out, just like the random walks we saw before, if you want to think about um, sequences of different lengths, it's more elegant to look at, at fractions, so the fraction of steps right and the fraction of steps left, which you can think of as kind of velocities right, velocities left, and a net velocity. So far, so boring. Now, the, the, the important bit, we want this agent, this person, to have an experience when they make the decisions. And we do that in the following way. Each time they make a choice, we draw a value of some utility random variable, capital U, from some distribution function 
which in general might be different for the right choices and for the left choices. And the idea is that the agent doesn't remember their, their whole sequence of past values of u. They just remember the maximum for the right choices and the maximum for the left choices. And I'll call those things u hat plus and u hat minus. I think the hat's a little bit small here, but remember that the hat is the peak value, the extreme. And it's that peak value that goes into their probability for making choices at the next step. And in particular, I take the, the so-called logit decision probabilities, which are popular in economics, but have a form that's kind of reminiscent of other things we know in physics, where the probability to go to the right to choose the plus choice has this form, probability to go to the left has this form. And capital T is the kind of level of noise in their decision. And I assume throughout that we start with um, zero experience for left and right. So u hat plus and u hat minus, both zero at the beginning. So let's unpack those probabilities a little bit and see what happens. Well, if the noise is very big, so if you're, you're very tired or very drunk or there are so many people around you that you don't think about your past at all, that's like having a large value of noise in the decision. In which case, p plus and p minus are both going to be approximately a half. You're back to tossing a coin and you're back to your, your ordinary random walk. On the other hand, if t is, is small, then you have a bias in the direction of whichever is bigger, u hat plus or u hat minus. So you're more likely to go in the direction where you remember a better experience in the past. Let's think first about the case where the distribution of experiences is the same for the two choices. So f plus cumulative distribution function for utilities to the, the right, and f minus at the center. However, at any given time, the distributions of the peak values for right steps and left value steps will in general be different because they will depend on the number of right steps and left steps you've had in the past. And that will be important later on. Then you can ask, well, what happens in the long time limit? perhaps you might guess one of two things. You might say, well, you know, this model is symmetric, so probably in the long time limit, I end up with u hat plus and u hat minus roughly the same, asymptotically the same, and in which case I'll go right with probability a half, left with probability a half. I'll have a mixed decision step state where half of my steps are left and half are right. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're coming to that. You're, 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 read, you're, you're, you're reading my, your mind. I haven't told you anything about the distribution yet, but that, of course, is going to be important. So hold that thought. Um, so you might guess either that you end up in some kind of symmetric case, or that perhaps you, know, you have a really good experience, let's say, for, for a right choice, and you think, okay, that's, that's the way to go, you're more likely to go that way, and then you're more likely to have an even better experience. And perhaps you can kind of get sucked by, by force of habit, by your early experiences, into being convinced that either going right is the only thing to do or going left is the only thing to do, and be in a sort of frozen decision state. And indeed, if you just take this model and put it on a computer and do simulations, you can see both of these things. So this is a an empirical histogram of velocities um, after, I think, 100 time steps. So minus one always going to the left, plus one always going to the right, and two different values of noise. And you see that the green points, well, they seem to have quite a nice distribution about zero, so they're somehow in this, this symmetric case. Uh, but the red points are peaked about either only going left or only going right, so the asymmetric fixed point. Yeah, you're, you're, you're spoiling my whole talk, you guys. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, the question is, how, how does this picture depend on the noise? That was Satya's question. And on the, the distribution of experience? That was the question from, from, from over here. And you can see that quite simply um, by making an approximation. 
that allows you to do some things analytically. And the idea is that instead of taking the actual values of the peak experiences, we approximate them by the, the characteristic largest value. That's the, the, the value from extreme value theory, the, the typical largest value after you've had that many trials of the random variables. And you can calculate it very easily. It's just a quantile. So if you've had x plus steps to the right, then the typical largest value you expect to see for right experiences is the value of u plus that solves this equation. And if you've had x minus steps to the left, the typical largest value is the value that solves this equation. And if you do this, it's an approximation, and we'll have to check that it works. For p plus and p minus are now just deterministic functions of the number of steps right and the number of steps left you've had in the past, or if you like, of the velocity you've had in the past. And now we get back to a random walker with probabilities for going right or left that depend on its past velocity. So we're back to a generalized elephant random walker with possibly some very weird dependence on the velocity, but nevertheless a dependence on the velocity, or a nonlinear polyer urn problem. And then you can play all the same games that I talked about before, looking for fixed points and checking their stability. So let's see how that works for the exponential case, partly because it's probably the easiest case, but also because it's the most interesting case. For the exponential case, well, even my first years know the CDF. The characteristic largest value goes like the log of the number of trials. But if you plug that in, to your, your delta function, which remember was the expected length of the next step, then it gives you this hyperbolic tangent form as a function of the, the velocity in the past. And you can very easily check, this will remind you of course of other things, that there are fixed points here, where delta v equals v, at v equals zero, and v equals plus or minus one. And then you can check their stability. So if you concentrate on the symmetric one, well, the slope at zero is one over lambda t, which means that if t is less than one over lambda, you predict that the symmetric fixed point is unstable. So the asymmetric ones, the peaks at the sides, are stable. And if t is bigger than one over lambda, then the symmetric fixed point is stable, um, and the asymmetric ones are unstable. So in this simplified version of the exponential model, you really can calculate the critical temperature. Let's check whether it works. So what I plot here is simulations for both this simplified model, so where I directly in my simulation, instead of remembering the, the history of experiences, I just take a value of u plus that depends deterministically on the number of steps right, and similarly for u minus and then simulations of the full model. And what I put plot is the root mean square of the velocity against noise, for exponential distributions with lambda equals one. So if I end up concentrated at plus or minus one, then I expect the root mean square velocity to go to one. And if I end up concentrated around the middle, I expect the root mean square velocity to go to zero. And these points are for increasing time. And the simplified model, unsurprisingly, if you've done the calculations correctly, does exactly what we predict. So as I increase time, I get closer and closer to one for values of noise less than one, and closer and closer to zero for values of noise greater than one. The full model is a bit more complicated. So still, for low values of noise, I approach one. And there's some kind of transition around one but as I increase time, I don't go to zero, I go to some finite value here. And that's, of course, because there are other fluctuations that we ignored that are fluctuations in the largest value. And you can do some rather dirty approximations that I won't talk about that, that give you this dashed line as an approximation for what happens here. But nevertheless, this simplified model gives us qualitatively a picture of what happens. And then, as I already hinted at, well, if you know anything about extreme value theory, you guess that there are going to be three classes of behavior. So you don't have to do the whole calculation again for every different distribution you think of. You expect there to be three classes. If your distributions have fat tails, like Pareto distribution, for example, then what you find from this simplified model 
is that you expect the symmetric fixed point to be always unstable. So if you wait long enough, you're always going to see something well into the tail of one of the distributions, be so convinced that's better, you go more and more likely in that direction, and you get stuck there forever. And again, these are simulations for the full model, the root mean square velocity against noise, and you see we converge to one for any value of noise. On the other hand, if the utility distribution is bounded, like a uniform distribution, for example, then the argument is that the symmetric fixed point is always stable. And that's easy to understand heuristically. There might be some metastable behavior at the beginning, but eventually I'll have seen basically the maximum for left steps and the right steps, and then my model looks symmetric, and I'm back to an ordinary random walk. And indeed, that's what you see in the simulations. Uh, for any value of noise, as I increase time, I go to six. The interesting case is exponential tails. We've seen the pure exponential, but more general exponential distributions like Gaussian, you still have this transition from a, a frozen state to a mixed state as you increase the noise. But now the position of the transition itself can move very slowly in a logarithmic dependence on time, either to the left or the right. So it's a bit more complicated. OK, now we've got a few minutes left. So let me get on to, to some more recent stuff. What we've, what we've learned from this simplified model is that even with choices that are a priori from the same distribution, if I have fat-tailed utility distributions or exponential distributions with low noise, I have a kind of ergodicity breaking, a kind of trapping regime where the time average velocity for a specific agent is either minus one or plus one, and is not the same as the time average velocity for the ensemble, which is still zero. But it doesn't really matter, right? Because the expected utility is the same for left steps and right steps, so who cares if I get trapped going one way or the other? Doesn't really make a difference. The interesting thing is what if I have heterogeneous choices? Then there's a possibility that Based on some early experience, I get conned into thinking that one of the choices is better, and it's actually the wrong choice in terms of expected values of utility. So how can I escape trapping in that wrong choice? And this was basically the PhD work of Vangelis, who's just finished with me. So I'm going to concentrate on the exponential case, because uh, we already saw that was the most interesting case. And what I show you here, both, again, for simplified model and for the full model, so the simplified model where we just make this approximation with the characteristic largest values. I show you the time and ensemble average value of the utility against noise. For the case where the distributions are both exponential, but the distribution for right steps has mean a half and for left steps has mean one. So in this case, going, going left is the best thing, um, and that would give me uh, expected utility of one. And you see that the simplified model and the full model have qualitatively the same behavior, so that's good. That means we can concentrate on trying to understand this simplified model. There are some things that you can see very easily. Well, if the, the noise goes to zero, then basically I make the first choice and then I always do the same. The first choice is symmetric, so half of the agents will go right and half will go left, and the average utility will be the average of those two things, which for the numbers I have is 0.75. On the other hand, if I fix time, so I fix myself on one of these curves, and I take noise to infinity, then eventually the noise overwhelms the memory, and I'm back in the case where I'm just choosing by tossing a coin. So then every agent is sampling both choices equally, but I get the same average utility. So again, if I go over here for long enough, I get back to 0.75. But somewhere in the middle, there's a peak. And even more interesting, as I increase the time, the peak gets closer and closer to the best I can possibly do. In other words, only going left and having an average utility of one. And you can understand that by trying again to do this kind of fixed point argument. Except now it's more complicated because the fixed points aren't fixed. You're in a kind of dynamical landscape with moving valleys, moving hills, 
Um, but you can still do some stuff there. And what you find is a prediction of three regimes, in the case where lambda plus is greater than lambda minus. Of course, you can do the opposite. For low values of noise, the noise less than one over lambda plus, you get this trapping that we saw before. As noise goes to zero, you're trapped equally in both choices. As you increase the noise, you have more chance of getting out of the wrong choice and into the right choice, but still some finite probability of being trapped forever in the wrong choice, so you get these curves. Then there's an intermediate regime between these two dashed lines where there's just enough noise that you're always able to escape the bad trap. You're always able to explore enough to escape the wrong trap and get into the right choice. And so if you wait long enough, these curves saturate at 1, and you can show that they go as t to the minus 1 with some log correction, and you can check that. And then you have a high noise regime, so to the right of this dashed line, where you no longer have trapping. You have a stable trajectory, an attracting trajectory in the middle, but that trajectory itself moves very slowly towards minus 1. So each agent is sampling both choices, but as time goes on, it samples more and more of the left choices. And so you also, in fact, saturate here, but more slowly as some power law in T that, again, you can check. OK, so I think I'm essentially out of time, so, so let me, me, me conclude. I hope I've, I've convinced you that, that systems with long-range memory have quite rich fluctuation behavior. And even from simple models, you can see some generic mechanisms. And then we talked about the, the, the second part, about the reinforcement effects of this kind of peak memory, which can lead to, to trapping. And actually, the same three classes of behavior were later seen in a, in a different model with uh, Jean-Philippe Bouchot and, and collaborators. And uh, you see very similar phenomenology. But more interestingly, for decisions with different utility distributions, you can be trapped in the wrong choice. But under certain conditions, you can identify the optimal level of noise where you have just enough noise to explore all the choices and settle on the right one and maximize the expected returns in the long run. And of course, there are, there are many extensions and open questions. Most burningly, perhaps, what happens if you have many agents who are interacting with each other, seeing other people's memories or other people's behavior. But let me, me stop there and invite questions from you. And this, by the way, is the head of our friend Jeremy Bentham. So I can see, perhaps, why they didn't, didn't display it. 